All right. Welcome everybody to 52 Living Ideas. I am, it's a sheer delight and I'm, it's a tremendous honor to have this new series of monthly conversations with Yasuhiko Kimura. You know, in a very short time, he's become a good friend uh, and a kindred spirit. So it's just wonderful to talk to him. And today we are going to be talking about Tao the Jing. So welcome Yasuhiko. Thank you. It's so nice to be with you. Wonderful. Um, you know, Yasuhiko, you know, he's, he, he's an amazing guy. Uh, he's a very deep philosopher. He's able to integrate kind of Chinese philosophy, Indian philosophy, Japanese philosophy, Western philosophy all together and look forward. So it's a really remarkable independent thinker. So it's, it's my honor uh, to be talking to him. So Yasuhiko, we have been studying Dao the Jing for yeah. the entire month of May in preparation for this talk. Um, we have done about 12 meetups. We've spent about 30 hours talking, uh, maybe about 30 to 40 people each of the time. Uh, and we've tried to uh, grapple with this. So tell me what was your encounter? What is your relationship with Dao the Jing? Well, it was uh, pretty uh, ordinary in Japan. Uh, in high school, we study uh, ancient uh, Japanese and Chinese uh, literature. So Dao De Ching, along with uh, Confucius and others, we needed to read. So that was the uh, initial encounter. And at that time, I was actually studying outside of the school, studying Buddhism, Buddhist philosophy, and immediately noticed the uh, similarity between Zen and uh, uh, you know, uh, Lao Tzu. Mm -hmm. And so over the years, you know, I have went back to Lao Tzu over and over again and reading and uh, sometimes just uh, open one particular chapter. You know, I have this, this book. This was published when oh, I was uh, 30 years ago. It's on the other side. Uh, yeah. Oh, there. Okay. Got, got it. Okay. Actually, there's a Jap Chinese, Japanese, uh, oh. ancient Japanese, ancient uh, uh, Chinese, and then uh, contemporary Japanese put together. I bought this book when I was 17. Mm -hmm. So I kept this book, you know, well over uh, 40 some years. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I have been, wherever, I even went, went this book with uh, India. Mm -hmm. I have kept this book for so many years. And so I have been reading this over and over. Um, so that's my uh, encounter. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, how, um, so that was the first time, but what has it done for you throughout throughout life? Why why what place does it hold in your life? You know, uh, whenever I uh, I become complex thinker, mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. I go back to Lao Tzu mm -hmm. and simplify myself. <laughs> wow. wow! Wow! That's that's beautiful. That's beautiful. Um, now you chose to translate it. Now, yeah. very few people choose to translate. So firstly, why did you choose to translate? What was the experience like? How did you approach translations? Speak a little bit about your translation. Yes, um, in 2000, uh, year 2000, uh, I was the director of Walter Russell Foundation. And uh, Walter Russell was this amazing genius who combined uh, science and spirituality into a unified uh, theory. And uh, he loved uh, Lao Tzu. And uh, he named his wife Lao. Mm -hmm. So Debbie Stilling became Leo Russell. Mm -hmm. And uh, they did talk about Lao Tzu and uh, I saw some of the translation they are using and I wasn't very fond of that translation. And also I realized that the people who are studying under uh, Walter Russell, although they, know, they knew about uh, uh, Lao Tzu, they didn't really read the book in a, in a deep way. Mm -hmm. So we had a quarterly magazine and we published you know, like a, every, every quarter we published magazine. So I started to translate Lao Tzu into English mm -hmm. and publish through that uh, publication. Um, so it has, uh, it was, originally designed for the uh, people 
who, are, who have studied Walter Russell's philosophy, uh, who have not, who had not studied uh, Lao Tzu in depth. Mm -hmm. So I didn't assume any uh, prior knowledge of uh, Lao Tzu or Chinese philosophy. At the same time, I assume the basic knowledge of uh, Walter Russell's philosophy. Mm -hmm. And Walter Russell used uh, three words uh, to describe the essence of nature. Balance, rhythmic, balanced interchange. And that's exactly the movement of Tao in, or reverse is in the movement of Tao, but it is basically cyclic movement. So rhythmic balance interchange. So assuming this knowledge of people, uh, I translated this book into English. Now that uh, after 20 years, I'm ready to revise it for a much wider audience who, who have knowledge of Lao Tzu. Wonderful, really looking forward to the new, new translation. Um, it, so let's, uh, what did you get by actually focusing and trying to translate? Because a translator, uh, I, what I found is that writing is very powerful. Personally, I found that writing is very powerful. When you actually just read something, you get mm -hmm. it up to a level. But in yeah. order to really understand something, you have to write in your own, you know, capture that in your own words. Mm -hmm. Doing the work of translation is like writing on steroids because you're mm -hmm. trying your best to capture mm -hmm. and you're going revising again and again to capture it. So what, what, what did you get? I mean, how was your grasp? Uh, different. So uh, there are uh, translators who have tried tried metaphrasing. Sounds like a Chinese, mm -hmm. but in whatever you do, it is an interpretation. So I did not metaphrase. I uh, paraphrased the original into English. Number mm -hmm. one, and number two, I wanted to. <sighs> convey the feeling mm -hmm. of reading original mm -hmm. in English as much as possible, which is not possible, but as much as possible. Mm -hmm. And uh, you are talking about oral tradition and in a written tradition. And so language is sound. Sometimes in Chinese, when you read Chinese, um, the, they use a particular character, but the meaning is different from the original character that was used because it sounds the same. Mm -hmm. Like a U, famous U, Mu. Mm -hmm. Original character and then the, the character we are using now, they have different meaning originally. You know, I have this uh, Chinese language etymology uh, dictionary, mm -hmm. <laughs> huge. <laughs> and I go through the period, you know, the, the, the meaning of the word changes. Mm -hmm. So when you translate Lao Tzu, you want to uh, check the meaning of the particular character used around that time. So I consulted this uh, uh, dictionary and tried to capture the meaning as much as possible. At the same time, the feeling of reading it. Mm -hmm. So, but the feeling of reading it come from me reading it in Japanese. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I am sure uh, if I know the Chinese sounds, uh, probably my translation would have been different. So the whole feeling that I get, I try to convey that in English as much as possible. This is one thing I'm very curious about. The, there is a deep Japanese tradition mm -hmm. of studying uh, the Chinese classics like Tao Te Ching, right? Yes. Can you talk a little bit about, about that? Okay. Originally, the Chinese, so Chinese character, Chinese had, Japanese had only uh, spoken language originally. Mm -hmm. Then they, so the Chinese, then Chinese character has sounds. So originally, Japanese start to use Chinese sounds only to uh, express Japanese. Mm -hmm. That's the first stage. Mm -hmm. Oral is the first stage and second stage is written, but only sounds using Chinese character. And second stage, 
because each Chinese character has meaning. There's a Japanese word that has different pronunciation, but it goes with uh, the Chinese character. Mm -hmm. So they begin to uh, reorganize Chinese character to mm -hmm. speak Japanese. Hmm. So let me show you, uh, let's see. I mean, any chapter is fine, but let me see. Let's go to Lao Tzu's uh, first chapter. I don't know if you can see this. Mm -hmm. So this is the original Chinese. Mm -hmm. And this is a Japanese way of reading it. Mm -hmm. They use all of the character connected mm -hmm. with uh, Japanese character that they were in, what, that was invented afterward. Mm -hmm. So I read this this way. Mm -hmm. Hmm. So later on, maybe the, somebody who can read Mandarin can read the first chapter, and I read this in Japanese in first chapter. Yes. Oh, that 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 would be great. Uh, we can. Uh, do you want to? Uh, let me just see uh, who's here. I I got uh, disconnected. Uh, I cannot see you. Oh. Let uh, me see. You. I, I can see you. Okay, okay. okay. You yeah, that's fine. That's fine. Uh, are you able to see me now? Yes. Okay. Very good. So, w whenever you want, we can do that. Um, do you know which of the words that you would like to read? Then I, we can have them also ready for okay. that. Yeah, we can do that. Okay. You want it now? Oh, uh, no, we can do it at any okay. point. Any point yeah, you yeah, want. Yeah. So, people can see the exactly. sounds is different. All right. So, what, what we'll do is I will do. Uh, Mandarin, we will do Japanese, okay. and then we will do your translation, and then we'll talk a little bit about it. That <laughs> That's interesting. Of, of bringing yeah. it all together. Yes, yes, yes. So this Chinese has no uh, differentiation between uh, noun and verb. Mm -hmm. Japanese has. So when you read Chinese this way, Japanese sometimes we read like this. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. each character is uh, used, and the meaning of the sentence is the same as the Chinese sentence. Wonderful, yeah. wonderful. Um, all right, so let's go to the next question. Yes. Uh, which is, why Thou De Jing now? Mm -hmm. um, what is the significance of Thou De Jing mm -hmm. in the 21st century? Yes. <clears throat> you see, uh, Taoism developed over the years over the centuries actually. And, but there is a underlying theme uh, in the most simple way is you can say return to nature. Mm -hmm. So in a Chinese uh, philosophy in Chinese history, Chinese culture, there's a differentiation between nature and man or art or artificial or culture. And Taoist message always has been to return to nature. Mm -hmm. And this uh, is a simple statement, but it is a very profound statement. And um, Francis Bacon famously said, nature to be commanded must be obeyed. Mm -hmm. That's very, there is a similarity to uh, Taoist thinking. So now today in the 21st century, highly developed uh, techno-scientific civilization, we have lived in the city using technology and we have moved away from nature in a, to a significant degree. At the same time, as Bakumi Safura said, Nature never allows anything to exist that is not nature, uh, natural. So we want to really find out. And today we have something like a, a transhumanist agenda where we are going to become more and more like a cyborg. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what culture, what technology, what artificial meant at the time of that Lao Tzu. Today, we have much more complex issue involved here. So we want to really ask this question. 
what is natural, mm -hmm. really? Mm -hmm. And is there any way to actually incorporate artificial in such a way that we can enhance nature and nature also enhancing uh, artificial? And in a more primitive sense, the Chinese culture and Chinese philosophers always dealt with this uh, issue. And today, I think we need to deal uh, with this issue in a much more profound and um, powerful way. Wow, wow, that was, that was wonderful. Um, let me go to the next question uh, to kind of just place, before we go dive into the details of um, Dao De Jing, uh, could you place Dao De Jing in the history of Chinese philosophy? Um, where, what role has it played in Chinese thought? Mm -hmm. um, I mean, let me just elaborate a little bit. You know, we in the West are not as aware of the traditions of China and India. And these are very deep, you know, traditions. And so I'm hoping that, you know, study of Dao De Jing is just a first step in going towards kind of looking at Chinese philosophy uh, as a whole. So what, what is the place of Dao De Jing in Chinese philosophy? Well, China, Chinese philosophy, you know, uh, depending on how you study it, but you know, you can go back 20,000 years ago. Mm -hmm. That's they say that in the I Ching, uh, the uh, Yin and Yang philosophy, cosmology came into existence. I mm -hmm. don't know if it's true or not. Mm -hmm. But anyway, uh, originally, let's say, probably like 3,000 years ago, uh, there was no particular schools of philosophy, wise men were working in the government and they, in, the, in that capacity, they used to teach philosophy. And then the dynastic structure started to uh, collapse. Mm -hmm. And those people became uh, wandering philosophers. And they used to call it in a hundred schools. There are hundreds of teachers, mm -hmm. you know, teaching their own philosophy. Mm -hmm. And it and then hundreds became smaller, <laughs> nine, and eventually you know like nine schools. Huh? One of which was Taoism, uh, 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 one of which was uh, Confucius, mm -hmm. and then gradually others got also you know absorbed, and uh, Confucius became the main teaching. And uh, Lao Tzu is the, the opposite. Mm -hmm. So in the history, that's, so many became like a two. Mm -hmm. Of course, you, you can't really say two, but basically two. Mm -hmm. And then they start to have an interaction. Mm -hmm. And then you have Neo-Daoism that incorporated the Confucius uh, thought. Mm -hmm. And Neo-Confucians that incorporated in, uh, the Taoist philosophy into theirs. So maybe the most advanced Chinese philosophy you can find in Neo-Confucius. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So there have been, so many to one, a uh, few, and a few became uh, re reintegrated. And it's basically the philosophers because there are few different uh, Taoist philosophers who have emphasized different things, yes? Mm -hmm. But, but the fundamental uh, tenet of Taoism and Confucianism state. What, how would you distinguish Taoism and Confucianism? Well, so depending on which period we talk about. Let's but, take the uh, kind of yeah, early, early periods. Basically, you know, originally, it was more uh, uh, Taoism is really return to nature. Mm -hmm. And uh, ethics. And politics is based on the law of nature. So culture needs to be uh, in alignment with, with nature. So law of uh, uh, society needs to be in accordance with Tao. And Confucius also taught Tao, but in more uh, cultural way, and uh, from the Taoist perspective, Confucius was imposing 
ethics onto humans, except uh, uh, unlike Taoist ethics, that is a natural unfoldment of Tao within. Mm -hmm. But neo-Taoist neo absorbed Confucius completely, and they thought that Confucius was the greatest sage above Lao Tzu and Chang Tzu. And the reason being, Tao that can be spoken is not real Tao, but Confucius, the so Confucius never spoke about it. Whereas Lao, Lao Tzu and uh, Chang Tzu, although they said we can talk about it, they somehow talked about it. But <laughs> Confucius knew it so clearly that he never even talked about it. In that sense, he was above Lao Tzu and the Chang Tzu. But fundamentally, it is the emphasis on uh, uh, nature over culture, which is Taoism. Uh, uh, Dao and it is uh, culture over nature is uh, Confucius. One, you can say that way. Uh, uh, one quick uh, follow-up question. Uh, you mentioned Zhang Zhu. Can you talk a little bit about what his contributions are in this, at, at this level? You know, when you read uh, Lao Tzu or Chang Tzu, you know that uh, they are anti-war and pacifist. Uh, but they say, if you have to go to war, end it quickly <laughs> with minimum, uh, minimum. So you can say Tao is uh, kind of an idealist. Really, mm -hmm. and uh, Sun Tzu, who must have been the contemporary of um, uh, Confucius, was supreme realist. Mm -hmm. And the war was going on. Mm -hmm. You can't just go back to nature and just be meditating. Mm -hmm. You are involved with uh, other humans, and we need to create a peace. So uh, he has devised this amazing set of strategies, uh, strategic mm -hmm. thinking, the way to think about strategy in war. Hmm. So that if you have to go to war, you win quickly. Okay. Yeah. Wonderful, wonderful. Um, all right, so let's dive now into the depths here. What are the fundamental principles? of Tao Te Ching? Well, there are a number of principles. Yeah. <clears throat> um, so let's say the ontology, epistemology, ethics, and politics, mm -hmm. following, following uh, Arist Aristotelian divisions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, ontology and the cosmology and the epistemology, they have never gone deep, although as Taoism developed, you know, they begin to think about this. And uh, in my view, and uh, the, not only my view, uh, many, many people say this, the book, the man Lao Tzu may have been the contemporary of uh, Confucius. The book itself, appears to be a collection of writings. And it, it should have been uh, written after the school of names flourished, mm -hmm. which means uh, I talk about this particular school because school of names is a, a school of philosophy. And as name says, they talked about what can be named and what cannot be named language, nature of language, and connection between language and reality. And Lao Tzu's first chapter started with name, nameable and, and unnameable. And that kind of thinking must have, uh, should have come after the school of uh, names. And Chang Tzu's uh, friend was actually a very famous uh, uh, 
scholar and then philosopher from school of names. So book itself has written maybe published or came to this particular form um, BC third or second BC. Uh -huh. And uh, the, the book has many different, so depending on who was the actual writer, there's a level, some are very profound and some are somewhat you know, shallow. Mm -hmm. And within one chapter, reading this carefully, it's possible somebody else uh, you know, inserted one or two sentences. Mm -hmm. Even starting from chapter one, I can tell you where I think somebody inserted and then the, the desire and desires come into the first chapter. Mm -hmm. That doesn't, isn't, does not uh, fit in the whole, whole philosophy. Mm -hmm. So uh, you need to read the, the book in such, in, in the, such in a way, you know, you need to have assumed the different people writing this. Mm -hmm. And some are more profound, some are shallow. Mm -hmm. Now the chapter one deals with ontology and epistemology. Mm -hmm. And what is nameable and what is unnameable. So ontological principle of Tao, Tao, Taoism is in a way very unique because so you know, in a Western philosophical sense, what is perceptible, perceptive, percept are all nameable, particulars all nameable. Mm -hmm. And there are universals that are also nameable. Mm -hmm. So particular and universals, like, uh, oh, the, this tree is beautiful. Uh, this painting is beautiful. Mm -hmm. Your wife is beautiful. My wife is beautiful. Mm -hmm. And his wife is beautiful. Uh, this flower is beautiful. So particular things, not only have names or the attribute, that attribute can become a universal beauty. Mm -hmm. So be the universal is nameable in that sense. Mm -hmm. Now, Lao Tzu is saying that the Tao is unnameable. So which is not a particular, so Tao isn't particular and Tao is not even universal, nameable universal. Number two, he, he, so what is Tao? It is not a name, it is a designation at the most. It is placeholder for that which is unnameable. Mm -hmm. And second, because he is using the language, he must designate something that is unnameable or unspeakable but the moment you speak about it, it become unnameable and nameable, their duality. Mm -hmm. When you say it is nothing, then nothing and something become uh, uh, dualized. Mm -hmm. Nothingness, somethingness, being, non-being. And he is saying epistemologically and ontologically, Reality is not flat. So there is a thing and uh, beauty and ugliness. And then you can see both. And here it is something else other than beauty and ugliness. Here's a nameable and unnameable. There's something else mm -hmm. about. Mm -hmm. So our consciousness is uh, not flat mm -hmm. and our uh, reality is not flat. It can go on and on. It is the gate of all mysteries. Mm -hmm. So those two are different in names and designations and in our recognition. But it's come from the same source. But when you go to the same source, again, you see the duality. So at each level, it is an ongoing duality, but the, our consciousness and reality itself is not flat. 
And that is a very profound insight into ontology and uh, epistemology into our consciousness. And uh, that is similar to today's quantum, quantum logic, yes? Yes. You see the wave and particles. But when you can see both at the same time, there's something else going on there. What is it? So one, one fundamental principle of uh, Taoism, which was in uh, expressed in seed form by Lao Tzu and then developed over the years, all the way to Tao of physics. <laughs> mm -hmm. Reality is not flat. It has levels. And our consciousness is not stuck in one level. It has different levels. And sometimes it shows up in a Hegelian way of dialectics in time, you know, thesis, synthesis, and synthesis. But timelessly, reality is leveled. Our consciousness has uh, different levels. And that is, uh, you know, uh, implied ontology epistemology in chapter one of uh, Dao De Ching. And he beautifully said that, you know, you can't talk about this, you can't name this, but you know, name and name, they are actually something more to this. But then when you say something more to this, it's again have something the opposite. And so I Ching is a yin and yang binary hexagram. Mm -hmm. Dao De Ching is yes, no, and maybe. Mm -hmm. Ternally, tetragram. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It is a three to the fourth power, 81 chapters. Mm -hmm. And the uh, hexagram, the I Ching is uh, two to the sixth power. It becomes 64. And uh, Lao, uh, Dao De Ching can be used in the same way as uh, I Ching that you can use uh, as a divination. And uh, the external logic, Mm -hmm. is, is very, very unique. It is not binary. Internally, the, this is an included middle. Mm -hmm. It is not excluded middle. Mm -hmm. So uh, Dao De Ching's chapter one, which is the most profound chapter of all of it, mm -hmm. it contains the whole universe in some ways. Mm -hmm. And it is a uh, you know, if you say in a fancy, fancy terminology we, we can use today, 20, 21st century, David Bohm's uh, terminology, we can say Tao is a super implicate order in which implicate order and explicate order and whole mo movement continuously exist. Mm -hmm. But the moment we say su uh, super implicate order, it becomes implicate. Mm -hmm. Therefore, there's more to more to this, this movement. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, when you meditate upon this uh, chapter one, it's quite remarkable. One of the most profound statement on ontology, uh, metaphysics and epistemology ever made. And this still today can stand today. It is absolutely contemporary. Wonderful. So from this core, yes. how does Tao yes. Ching uh, yes. develop for yeah. the So that's Tao. I'll go back to Tao again. And then De, uh, Te, mm -hmm. in Japanese, Toku. Mm -hmm. So Te is, is the, in the human way, it is an embodiment of Tao. And nothing in nature is not embodiment of Tao. So it is a manifest Tao, 
which we can recognize, we can name. And ethically speaking, to be virtuous is to be in integrity, consciously in integrity with Tao. Mm -hmm. So sometimes I use the word cosmic integrity to translate uh, that. Mm -hmm. So in another words, in the contemporary English, to be virtuous, to, be, to embody Tao and to live as virtuous human being is to be authentic. That's where the uh, Taoist uh, ethics can be reinterpreted. But they are basically saying this. In, in society, we live in an ethical code that are imposed. It is inauthentic. It leads to pretension. Authentic virtue is living in integrity with Tao. So a person's action is a manifestation of Tao. And therefore, at each moment, his action is authentic. And uh, <clears throat> there's a terminology called the, the word mimetic desire. Mm -hmm. You know, a uh, French uh, philosopher, René Girard, mm -hmm. mimetic desire. So when we, uh, we have a lot of desire, you know, Tao, the Lao Tzu or Chang Tzu, they don't deny uh, desire, neither Buddha actually. There's an authentic natural desire as be, being human. It is a part of Tao that, you know, we get hungry, we eat. We fall in love with women. And we want to make love with, uh, you know, somebody you love. You want to have a basic comfort. You enjoy something beautiful. Those are the natural desires, it's the authentic desires. And then there's a mimetic desire that we, acquire through courage, uh, culture. Mm -hmm. And Lao Tzu and Buddha, they are denying those mimetic desire. It is a conditioning. Greed is a mimetic desire. Natural desire for comfort is not, or abundance is not uh, uh, mimetic desire. So one needs to be extremely conscious to be able to differentiate between the two. So uh, in my uh, classes, I often say this, whole, uh, the whole our lives, we are taught to be somebody <laughs> in society. So you study and you acquire degrees and, this, 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 and then you want to be somebody. Uh, in my class, you are, uh, you are required to be you, to be yourself. And that is a Taoist teaching. So to be, be thyself. Mm -hmm. And without being thyself, you cannot know thyself. They go together. Mm -hmm. Yes? Yeah. So uh, Taoist uh, ethics is be authentic and be who you are and let everything be uh, what, they, uh, what it is in its glory. Mm -hmm. As opposed to uh, artificial imposition on particular rules and principles. Got it. Let, let, let me try to put it in my own words and tell me yes. what, whether this, I mean, the, the thing that I see here is you know, I think the division that you talked about, kind of metaphysics, epistemology, ethics, and politics, that's beautiful. Taoists have a very different metaphysics than Confucianism, and in many ways, most of Western philosophy. Mm -hmm. Because what it is saying is that, listen to nature is, you know, it is what it is. And 
you are just a you part of it and everything is part of it that is the starting point so that's like the metaphysics of saying mm -hmm. that is it mm -hmm. and every time you get lost come back to it and you'll be okay mm -hmm. and you will get lost mm -hmm. at epistemological level the effort to name things is going to capture only some part of these you know it is going to capture particular manifestations of it mm -hmm. but never mm -hmm. nature itself mm -hmm. so don't get hung up on whatever words that you mm -hmm you produce because those are only temporary manifestations. Yeah. They are useful, they are create, creators of 10,000 things, mm -hmm. but they're very limited. Mm -hmm. Always go back to the Tao. Mm -hmm. In ethics, all you have to do is to follow the Tao. Mm -hmm. There are all kinds of words, there are all kinds of social systems or habits mm -hmm. that are pushing, that are going to push you this way or that way. Mm -hmm. All you have to do is to come back. Mm -hmm. And at a political level is that if you're working with other people, work according to the Tao, according to their own nature, so that it is smooth working. You are not trying to thrust certain of your ideas or social systems onto something which doesn't really fit in. You're, you're trying to say, how is it? And just work with it. So that's how I see kind of it flowing. Does that? Oh yeah, that I totally agree with you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm maybe trying to make it a little more uh, philosophical, probably, but absolutely, totally, yes, correct, yes, yes. You see, and then at the same time, when you uh, read the uh, Taoist literature into the neo Taoism stuff, and again, but, uh, is it, uh, I forgot to say, Buddhism had a profound impact on the neo, neo Taoist and the neo Confucius uh, thinking. So now you have Buddhism also. But you know, uh, the connection, um, the similarity uh, in Buddhism and the Taoism, one area is they say formless is in form mm -hmm. and uh, form is in formless, unnameable is in named and name is unnameable. They begin to see the the you know in and yang signs you know there's a opposite is always inside and actually to actually not only to see this to consciously create that way of living will keep you in balance mm -hmm. yes. yeah. um i mean i tr always try to collect connect ideas that i learned uh you know between each other I mean, one of the most profound thinkers i know of is louis sullivan and he talks about form and function Mm -hmm. So function to him is the nature, you know, nature of nature and your own nature. Mm -hmm. And so it's like the Tao and the Tao in you. Mm -hmm. That's what you're trying to do. Mm -hmm. You do create forms. You use, so words are forms. The things that you build are forms. The social systems that you build are forms. But form follows function. Mm -hmm. So that it has to always follow function. And it tends to actually go away from function. Mm -hmm. Moment things are created, they start to go away. Mm -hmm. Even when they were created in a most beautiful way, mm -hmm. they tend to go mm -hmm. away. So it's a question of coming back to the function, coming back to the Tao. Yes, yes. And that, that is uh, Spinoza's conatus. Mm -hmm. Yes, exactly. Yes. Wonderful. Now, there was one point um, about the development of Taoism, the four stages. Could you talk briefly about that? Yeah, uh, it, it is... Uh, in one sense, chronological, mm -hmm. but also like uh, Lao Tzu and uh, Chang Tzu's uh, uh, writings contains at least three of them. So the first stage was um, Yang Chu, whose writing uh, has not, uh, you know, uh, survived, but he is in chapter seven of Li Tzu. Mm -hmm. uh, the original, the simplest form of Taoism, return to nature and uh, leave society basically mm -hmm. and go back to nature. Very simple, uh, original, primitive Taoism. Then you have Lao Tzu, second stage, but again, and then Chang Tzu, the third stage. And uh, Lao Tzu has not only the second stage, but the, some of the third stage, like a chapter one, and then you know, first stage as well. Mm -hmm. And Chang Tzu, 
is a sad stage, but it, like in a in a chapter of uh, Chang Tzu is uh, mainly uh, probably written by himself, and it is a sad stage. But then you have second and uh, first stage also, and so first stage is uh, this go back to nature and uh, avo avoid <laughs> denounce the <laughs> society. <laughs> and, uh, second. Um, Lao Tzu's uh, thinking stage of development is begin to see the fundamental uh, uh, principle Dao, uh, Dao and um, not only living uh, uh, in accordance with Lao, uh, uh, Dao, but also begin to uh, formulate an ethics uh, society in accordance with so if the people follow Dao, what kind of society will come into existence? And if the leaders follow, the, follow Dao, what kind of leadership that he or she will have? Uh, in this case, he, she is never can come into the picture mm -hmm. at that time, mm -hmm. <laughs> he will have. So they, they are no longer just avoiding a, a society, but you know, they begin to see the Dao as a, fundamental building principles of an ideal society and ideal uh, leadership. And then when going to Ch uh, Changchu, it takes on a more mystical, spiritual uh, connotation. And uh, it has a deeper uh, insight or investigation into the self and also the nature of oneness and transcendence. Uh, so what was in the chapter one of Lao Tzu has been more elaborated in the Chang Tzu. And then later on, uh, Neo-Daoism, uh, which had a different name in, uh, originally, but anyway, so it was more like a integrating other school of thought mm -hmm. on the basis of Daoism. And we can say we are in the fifth stage. Mm -hmm. Because when neo Taoists or neo Confucians they integrated the other schools of thinking, it was all in Chinese philosophy. Mm -hmm. Then 1788, the the first translation of Lao Tzu into Latin was presented at the Royal Society in London, 1788. Oh, wow. wow! And uh, uh, <clears throat> philosophers begin to uh, you know so Schopenhauer. And Hegel actually talk about Lao Tzu. And Nietzsche was, of course, more into Buddhism than Lao Tzu. And of course, uh, transcendentalists of this country, they have uh, read uh, Lao Tzu. And Heidegger, last century, he got deeply into uh, Lao Tzu and Tao. And I was just sharing with you his, uh, his lecture. Mm -hmm. on the nature of language, in which he actually talks about uh, Dao De Ching. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, Dao, actually, he didn't explicitly say Lao, uh, Lao, uh, Dao De Ching. Yeah. So uh, we have entered a stage where we begin, we integrate Eastern, so Western philosophers, Western uh, Indian thinkers mm -hmm. integrate Dao, and Taoists can integrate others. So it, it, we have entered a long period, starting in 1788, we are in the fifth stage of you know, neo-Taoism, where- Wonderful. People, yeah, so, you know, all those, uh, our colleagues who have studied uh, Dao De Ching many years, they are, you know, uh, fifth stage, we are all fifth stage neo-Taoists, uh, each in, uniquely integrating uh, Taoist thought. Wonderful. Um, let me ask a general question. Yes. How would you relate Tao Te Ching to the Western corpus, the Western philosophy? Uh, you know, uh, it is not just uh, Chinese, but uh, Chinese and Japanese, especially. Indian philosophy is a little bit different, but you know, uh, they, um, their mode of thinking is different from Western mode of thinking. I say this 
like our brain has two hemispheres, mm -hmm. left and right. Eastern and the Western mode of thinking, mind, is in, in a way similar. So left hemisphere is like Western thinking and right hemisphere is like Eastern thinking. And Eastern thinking, Eastern way of uh, understanding, absorbing is more like an uh, aesthetic appreciation. Whereas the Western mode of thinking and understanding is rational, theoretical. So articulation in the Western culture is important. Whereas the Eastern culture and Chinese language, Japanese language both, suggested. So the difference probably come from this. <clears throat> the Western civilization is maritime civilization. Greek, they are actually Phoenicians and Greeks, they are maritime people. They are ongoingly uh, communicating with different culture. So they needed to articulate their thought to be able to communicate. Chinese civilization is a farmer civilization. It, they, are, they are born in the same place, they are with a group of people. They didn't need to say too much to understand each other. So deep thought are more uh, suggested than articulated. Actually articulation was less uh, appreciated than uh, suggest su suggestions. So from this way of thinking, it's like everything like a poetry in, in a way. So you appreciate, you understand in the form of aesthetic appreciation intuitively. <coughs> and Western civilization is always articulation and theory, explanation. Now, from this. No, 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 I, I just want to take time to just look at this because this is really fundamental. This is really, really powerful. And uh, we've been talking about it in multiple ways. So uh, for example, this is the conflict between mythos and logos, mm -hmm. where in mythos, you are kind of demonstrating something from a story, which is perceptualized, which is um, high definition. It is physical, it is emotional, it has got tone to it. It has people, personalities, and the message is carried not explicitly, but implicitly yes. through all of this versus logos where it is definitions and counting of saying these are the, the principles. So those are the two things. The other found fundamental way in which we are looking at it is the difference between the scripts. Mm. So alphabet versus ideograms. Um, and that's a very powerful, I'm just beginning to explore this, but I want to Kind of talk this out because it's um, see what happens is that in in Chinese right you have to know like forty thousand characters in order to be literate, and each of those characters is tied closely perceptually to reality to nature. Whereas alphabet we just have twenty six and those are meaningless sounds by themselves. It's by concatenation of it in a sequential left brain way that you create meaning. Whereas you look at a Chinese character, it hits you. The meaning is right there. No sequence is necessary. So it's parallel right brain. So even at the level of the script itself, there I see a difference. And script, I mean, again, you know, again, following the work of you know, Julian James or Walter Rong, they spend a lot of time of saying the technologies that we use, the scripts that we use, how does your mind work as a result of it? So alphabet lends itself to sequential process processing because only after sequence, you have any meaning whatsoever. Whereas this or left brain, this one, the ideograms, they are really good at parallel processing. And you put those things down. Um, they're also, because it is visual, they're suggestive. You know, they suggest many, many things together. And you put two of them together, it, they suggest different combinations. And each person may be able to take a different thing. So, uh, so at the level of just, even at the level of scripts, 
I think there is a difference between these two cultures. Yes. Does that make sense to you? Yeah, I agree. Actually, we talked about the last time we, we spoke. Mm -hmm. No movement of your eyes. Uh, <laughs> yes. Yes, I agree. Yes, yes, absolutely. And uh, so now that uh, we're some people are being trained by emojis uh, to become mm -hmm. more pictographic. <laughs> <laughs> right. I really don't know the difference between those two emojis. You know, some are smiling and some are uh, laughing with uh, with laughter. I mean, <laughs> laughing with uh, tears. You know, many different. <laughs> yes. 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 Uh, yes. Wonderful. So please, please go on. Uh, you you were saying that that is the foundation, and you were uh, continuing on that. Uh, so. <clears throat> If you remember, um, Spinoza talks about three levels of knowledge. Mm -hmm. The one is, uh, you know, primitive, just being informed, he says, and then go into real knowledge, which is based on reason. And uh, he explicitly said that uh, his books are written at that level. Then he goes to another level, is the intuitive. Mm -hmm. So he actually praises the intuitive knowledge higher than the you know, uh, rational knowledge, where he stays in terms of uh, his writing. Mm -hmm. And uh, Eastern, color, uh, Eastern way of knowing is in that sense, very intuitive. Mm -hmm. And uh, actually, let's say if you are in love with somebody, <clears throat> you can never really articulate the experience you have. So anything that we fully experience and whole of our intelligence and our consciousness involved, it is actually beyond word. And, but intuitively you can actually experience, experience, understand and understand it. And uh, one of the greatest benefits of actually studying Eastern philosophy, preferably through the original language. But even without it, you begin to really absorb that element so that both brains begin to work and once the Western mind begin to absorb that intuitiveness, which will be in a higher function than the original intuitiveness of a Chinese or Japanese, because you have gone through this rational, rigorous reason. Mm -hmm. oh. Yes? Yes, absolutely. So uh, to me, that is one of the most important things. Secondly, uh, specifically with uh, Dao, you know, what, 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 one sense when you embody Dao, what happens in, in your own experience is that uh, you become like a fulcrum of a seesaw. You experience yourself as like a still point silent, now to talk about the spoke of the, you know, wheels and the, at the center, center point hub, you begin to experience this, uh, like a, this emptiness, stillness. Uh, you never really realize you are, oh, now I am embodying Tao, no. After the fact, you realize, ah, oh. and that is a moment also the state of flow And uh, so you will know uh, how much you have embodied Tao by reflecting upon your life and your life experiences where you experience yourself as a fulcrum, stillness and emptiness. Now, uh, Zen in particular, but uh, also uh, Chinese uh, culture in general, and Japanese too, which was influenced by uh, Chinese. When you look at the paintings, paintings, Chinese paintings, Zen paintings, there are a lot of empty spaces. Sometimes it is almost that they put something to emphasize the emptiness. Western, Western paintings, 
you have a campus, you must feel the whole thing. <laughs> There's no emptiness. <laughs> and uh, it's quite interesting, you know? And so another element of really absorbing Eastern virtue is to begin to experience your, your, yourself and, and as this hub and also appreciating the space. That's why he, uh, Lao Tzu talks about the usefulness of useless. Mm -hmm. You see, actually, he actually talked about the cup. Mm -hmm. Emptiness without, I, I have a coffee inside and, or glass, water inside. And this, the, that's another aspect of uh, learning from uh, Taoism. We can actually incorporate it into our life especially today in the busy, busy, busy life. We want to take a vacation from things and uh, into nothing. We want to take a vacation from time and into timeless. And uh, Taoism teaches a great deal about this art of living as a space, as a usefulness. Uh, uselessness. Um, wonderful. I, I want to just connect it to a couple more ideas and then we'll, uh, folks will open it up to questions. So if you have questions, just go ahead and type an exclamation mark uh, in chat. Um, so Yasuhiko, I mean, this is so deep. I mean, and this actually connects to so many things. For example, I'm reading Martin Buber's I Thou. Uh -huh. And that is essentially saying the same thing. You know, there is like a metaphysical relationship that you have between you and nature or you and another person. And that is very deep. And that is very real. That is, that is really what is going on. Mm -hmm. And then you can name and talk about it. And when you do that, you capture aspects of it. But if you focus on the aspects of it, you lose the focus on the, on the relationship itself. Mm -hmm. So it is all about kind of this authentic relation, relationship mm -hmm. between you and nature, you with your own nature, you with the nature of the other person mm -hmm. um, and all of it. The other thing that uh, you talked about reminds me of the distinction that people like Marshall McLuhan make between figure and ground. Mm -hmm. You know, the ground is much larger. You know, nature is much larger than whatever it is that your conscious mind is focusing on right now. Mm -hmm. And to be, to have the humility of the fact that your conscious focus is limited mm -hmm. is also kind of another theme mm -hmm. that runs through mm -hmm. um, this, uh, this great work. Yeah. So, um, so- You know, uh, yeah. fundamental duality, you can say one, many. Mm -hmm. And many is in one and one is many. And many is, can be named. But since one is in many, once you begin to look at the, each one of the many, it's become unnameable. There's way beyond. And each one has form. But when you really look into each, each one, it is like a fra hollow fractal of the whole. And uh, it becomes, again, unnameable. It's really amazing. Uh, <laughs> Duality, non-duality, <laughs> manyness, dynamics of one in multitude, and, and then stillness of multitude in one is a beautiful, beautiful uh, experience, and it is ongoing. At the same time, it is timeless. Uh, wonderful. Do you want to make any uh, closing statements before we uh, open it up for questions? No, we can okay. continue. All right. Um, okay. All right, folks. So uh, there are many new. Uh -huh. Why don't you, uh, the lady, uh, the, uh, somebody can read the first chapter one. Oh, yes, 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 yes. We have to do that. And I'll read um, in, uh, in, in Japanese. Yes. Uh, Jean, would you be able to read the first chapter? Or? Uh, yeah, sure. Okay. Uh, so what we're going to do is, uh, folks, uh, we're going to read the first chapter first in Chinese, then in Japanese, and then um, Yasuhiko will read uh, his uh, translation. Go ahead, Jean. Uh, 
Uh, which one do we read? Uh, the first one. Okay, let me find my book. Sure. Yeah, they have a different, so chapter one, right? Chapter one. Okay. 道可道非常道,名可名非常名,无名天地之始,有名万物之母。常无欲以观其妙,常有欲以观其脚,此两者同出而异名,同谓之玄,玄之又玄。重妙之门。Thank you, Jean. Go ahead, Ian. Uh -huh. yes. Some words are pronounced the same way. うん。道の道と過ぎは、浄土にあらず。七の名と過ぎは、浄明にあらず。七し、天地の始めには、七あれ、万物の母こそ。故に浄もはもってその妙を民と欲し。浄有はもってその虚を民と欲し。この両者、
material nature, but ecology now is emerging, which is involved with uh, organic or living nature. And that seemed to me more complex in its unfolding. And it seemed to me Western thought is concerned not only in the unfolding of the process, but the detail in the mechanics of the unfolding. And so like now with ecology, we are beginning in the West to talk about the unfolding of the process, which is much more complicated in a living organism in nature uh, than and whatever, is there ultimately a difference because Western thought want to understand the unknown and its unfolding through the mechanics, even in a complex situation of organic unfolding. Yeah. Could you address that? You see, uh, let's say uh, you're driving and uh, since if you know how to drive well, you know exactly how to turn, how to respond to the other cars. But when you want to explain how you drive in language, it becomes extremely complex. When, uh, when you are in a martial artist and then you are brilliant and you're a master and then somebody want to you know, learn what you do and you explain and probably you can write 10 volume books in how why you do this and how you move this body and what what the reason uh, you can exhaust 10 volumes of books, but you may not be able to really explain. And even if you succeed, people who are reading that explanation can never uh, manifest their, uh, their understanding into their movement. So there is a different function uh, in, uh, you see our intelligence is like a holistic. You know, we have a mental intelligence, we have a so-called gut feelings and we have a you know, physical intelligence, we have many intelligences uh, combined. And uh, in the Western uh, science, you know, you, are, you want to satisfy mental intelligence. At the same time, that understanding in that mental intelligence is not going to be permeating into physical intelligence, intuitive intelligence, your heart intelligence, and so on and so forth. But Taoism is in a way teaching people this holistic intelligence. So they don't get into details, but once you master this holistic intelligence, you behave properly and accordingly, according to the law of nature, without being able to explain. And I think that's the difference. And I don't think you can ever, uh, so you can have both. You know, now we are uh, Western civilization uh, incorporating Eastern way of thinking and living. And so you can satisfy your intellectual curiosity maximum, maximally, yet you can also be a Taoist in your living. And, uh, you know, in one of the chapters, uh, Lao Tzu says, you know, to learn, to acquire knowledge, you gain more and more of information. And to learn Tao, you actually lose more and more of it. And uh, we can do both. You know, uh, original Taoist was against acquiring knowledge in that sense, unnecessary information. And today we require an enormous amount of information to be able to function. So we don't need to deny the, you know, uh, acquiring of information, knowledge, but at the same time, we can maintain this, you know, uh, emptiness and nothingness at the same time. And uh, to me, that is a challenge we have today. You know, uh, we need to have enormous amount of knowledge and we need to know how to deal with the information knowledge and some are unnecessary, absolutely. <laughs> but uh, you get the sense, you know, uh, what is the information you need and how to maintain emptiness at the same time. Wonderful, thank you. Thank you, Yasuhiko, and a great question, uh, P. Chan. Next up is going to be Stefan, Joe, Madeline, Maritza, Rich, and Evanique. Stefan. 
Uh, hi. So this sounds to me kind of like the Alan Watts idea where he talks about if if you start I'm paraphrasing a little bit, but if you start articulating the games that you play, then you kind of get taken out of it. And part of the human experience is to get so engrossed in all the games we play in life, whether they be board games or social interaction or whatever, that if you start to articulate it, then you kind of remember that you're playing a game and then you get pulled out of it and you're not as into it. So one, I'm wondering if you've ever heard of this. And two, do you think there's a certain point where you should just stop talking about this? Like if you kind of just get it then maybe just stop talking about it forever? Yes. Um, I have read uh, most of Aram Watts when I was young. So I don't remember the detail of what he said, but uh, he was uh, one of the greatest uh, exponents of uh, Zen and to a lesser degree Tao and uh, same lesser degree uh, Hindu uh, philosophy to the West. And uh, <clears throat> I don't know if I'm uh, responding to your question directly, but you know, uh, in the, when we survey Eastern and Western philosophy, you know, you can find a number of Western philosophers who are, who have said something similar to Lao Tzu. And um, go, going all the way back, uh, somebody like uh, Heraclitus said something similar. And he was actually maybe con contemporary, <laughs> contemporary of Lao Tzu and uh, Confucius. And uh, there's a concept that uh, he used. It was not himself originally, but uh, uh, he used a different words, but uh, enanthromia, you know, uh, when things goes in one extreme, it tend to go back to the other, other, other end. So when you go to the extreme, it goes back. Extreme uh, collectivism tend to make people going back to individualism and the extreme individualism tend to move people back to collectivism. So the best way to maintain the uh, social harmony is when you go into individualism, you want to have an element of collectivism. And when you go to collectivism, you want to have an element of uh, individualism. And everything is this way, just like in uh, symbols, when you have in pre uh, preponderance of in, you want to make sure you have a yang element. When you have a preponderance of yang, you want to make sure you have an element of in. So uh, in our lives, you know, when you want to go into the detail intellectualization, you always want to have an element of non intellectualization And if you have this balance, so you don't, stay still, you move around. Like staying in the fulcrum means, you know, you actually your seesaw is moving, but uh, there's, you don't go all the way to extreme, otherwise it will uh, collapse. So whenever you go into any movement, following down, you can go into physics, mathematics, you know, uh, philosophy, any form of intellectualization, you always want to have maintained within your consciousness that element of the, un, the sense of the unknown and sense of the uh, infinite and sense of silence and sense of stillness. When you can maintain this, uh, you keep a balance. And then in the evening, you will go back to the stillness more, but you still maintain the element of activity. And so to me, that's one of the ways to really uh, uh, practice Dao Te Ching is to always remain conscious and remain in the, at the fulcrum and never go into any extreme, but you don't need to deny any activities that you have. No action doesn't mean no action. It is a balanced action on the basis of uh, uh, Dao. So 
I may not have asked answered your question directly, but you know, to me that is very important element. And then, um, as far as I remember, uh, Aaron Watts said something similar. Wonderful, thank you. Uh, next up is going to be Joe, followed by Madeline. Joe. Yeah, so I have a just a question that you maybe could expand upon the idea of authentic virtue and how that differs from virtue and say the Greeks uh, or Stoicism of things. You know, what is the distinction between those two? You see, <clears throat> fundamentally, it is <clears throat> how the virtue is in accord with your own nature. So as a child, you learn particular kind of behavior. It is mimetic. But you can learn this if the people who are teaching this are aware of this Tao, <laughs> the conatus, uh, the authentic unfoldment of being human, then it is like a natural unfoldment from the child to the adult, mature adult. But when it is taught, like what you should do without uh, awareness of one's nature, it becomes inauthentic. So say it may be the same virtue, but it is the relationship you have with the virtue. So that's why the they is also power. You know, it, there are a number of ways of translating this. It, it's not virtue, it can be. Uh, it, it also means integrity, it also means authenticity, and it also means power. The, and uh, when you are authentic, you have uh, your inner power. When you are authentic, you are in integrity with Tao. Yeah? So that's the thing. You know, so in teaching children, they need, they need to become somebody. <laughs> but they, need to, they can become somebody in the process of becoming who they are. Yes. <laughs> no, so, no. Yeah, so parents are very, it is extremely important for parents to really be conscious of the child's, you know, uniqueness. <laughs> I mean, one of the things that I see in um, several of these chapters is the fact of actually leading by example. Exactly. Because what you're doing is that if you, if, if you want somebody else to actually follow the Tao, the most powerful thing yeah. is for you to actually live it. Yes. Um, if you're trying to use words to get them to do something, that is going to be more inauthentic. Yes. And you know, children actually learn by examples. You know, they watch parents. And uh, parents are watching TV and tell the kids that uh, you have to read other books. They don't have to read. <laughs> they will imitate. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. That's how people learn. Yes, by example. And they're absolutely correct. Yes. Excellent. Uh, next up is going to be Madeline, Maritza, Rich, Evanique, Amon, Jean, and Heron. Uh, Madeline, go ahead. Yes. Um, thank you so much for this presentation. Uh, You've mentioned uh, the implicit and explicit, which made me think of David Bohm's book, uh, Wholeness and the Implicit Order, which always makes me think of time. And I'm wondering if, uh, from based on your studies of Taoism and your experiences uh, meditating, if you could discuss uh, when, <clears throat> I guess I would say when time arises in Taoism philosophy. Chan? Time. 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 Time, okay. When time arises in Taoism. Because time arises out of timeless, it arises at every moment. Wonderful. It's more like Buckminster Fuller said that in the best way, life is the timeless manifesting life as the reaction past and resultant future. So every moment is like a momentum of eternity. And that momentum of eternity result as future and past. Future is like a resultant and past is like a reaction. 
and an ongoing basis, time arises from the eternal, it, as a moment, moment of eternity. And I don't know any, any particular place we're allowed to talk about time, but looking at the, on, on, looking at Tao ontologically, that's how I would, I would say. So time is a momentum of eternity, arising in eternal at every moment of time. Beautiful, beautiful. Next up is Maritza followed by Rich. Maritza. Sorry, I was uh, writing that down. Um, <laughs> I was hoping to ask you to expand a little bit upon um, this concept of when you mentioned a little earlier the idea that um, there, there was, was a low. low there is a problem with your audio. Uh, let's let's go with somebody else. Just work on your audio, and we'll, I'll come back to it in a second. Okay, uh, Rich, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, my question is. How do you apply Taoism to your daily life? Areas like relationships, lifestyle practices, health practices, and spiritual practices as a general idea. Yes. Uh, two things. Number one, um, as I said, you know, uh, manifesting Tao is like a being a fulcrum of a sisal. So we are, from the moment of, uh, you know, well, we get up in the morning until we go, retire. We are in an ongoing state of movement. And uh, if you can remain uh, aware of the fulcrum of your movement, not only physically, but also emotionally and mentally, that is a, if you can remain in, in the fulcrum for 24 hours, at least 12 hours of your, uh, awakening hours, then that is a manifestation of Tao in your life. And, uh, you know, we forget, but then we can go back and somehow find a place of stillness, fulcrum, silence. And you always pay attention to uh, that moment. So this is a Buddhist meditation, but also Taoists uh, uh, practice this. You know, when you watch your breathing, Normally people pay attention to uh, breathing in and breathing out. But in between those two, there is a moment of pause. So you start to pay attention to the pause, breathing in the pause, breathing out the pause. And then you, when you become aware of the pause as well as in and out breathing, you know, you are one level higher in your awareness than being aware of your breathing. Most people are not aware of breathing at all. <laughs> so you start to pay attention to breathing and eventually this pause, still point. And then you begin to see your movement. Physical movement has that, that, that place, you know, frequent uh, place. And then your emotional and mental movement also has a frequent place. And then be centered there. That is a practice of, uh, uh, Dao. And then you can use this uh, Dao De Ching. You can put that in the, next to your uh, uh, pillow before you, you go to bed or after you get up in the morning. Actually, two of the best. Before you go to bed, you read, just open any page and read, just reflect upon it and go to bed. When you get up in the morning, you open whatever page and read, look at the lesson, and then start the day. You know, uh, that is a wonderful way of using Dao De Ching. Excellent. Next up is going to be Maritza followed by Evanique. Maritza. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, so I was hoping you could expand a little bit upon this concept of um, the embodiment of Tao being flow, like, is it a concept of as you move forward in, in embodying and practicing the Tao, it's where you enter flow? Is it a desire to remain in a constant state of flow? Well, when you have an uh, intention to be in the constant of state of flow, 
that intention will prevent you from being in a constant state of flow. So, so as I said to the previous, you know, uh, uh, gentleman, uh, just pay attention to your breathing, and then there's a pause. And then you ask, reflect yourself when you're moving. Right, right now you're sitting. Yes, maybe comfortable position. Okay, you're taking a, a, taking a balance. There is a point of a, a fulcrum. Do you, do, you, do, you, do you see that? Usually it is, you know, somewhere in the bottom of your spine. <laughs> Just kidding. Like uh, when you meditate in a in Zen monastery or you know Hindu temples, you know you uh, you you sit on the cross legs, and you you find the still point, center point, and whatever you do, you always find a point, and that's how you relax yourself. And some people don't have the place. They, they cannot be still. Obviously you are still, so you have, you know how to find a place. And when you are thinking, sometimes you pause and then think again. So think and rethink the think, thought that you had. Always creating some pause that will bring you back to the center. So don't worry about flow. Flow is a natural flow. <laughs> it is an artificial. <laughs> so go back to your fulcrum. Or this is a question you want to ask. Okay, where is it? You know? mm -hmm. Wonderful. Thank you. That, that, was, that, was, that was great. Very useful. Uh, I, I love the idea of both kind of the fulcrum in space and in time in, in yes. brief. So beautiful. Uh, next up is Evanique followed by M Eamon. Evanique. Hi, um, my question is, and I think you partially answered it already, is what is the best way or what is the, I, I shouldn't even say the best way, what is the way to study the Tao? Like, do you, I, I guess you, you just answered the flow part of the question. So uh, do you let it flow? Is it being present? Is it practice? Um, what, is the, what is the way to study the Tao, especially for new people? Just gaining knowledge of it. So uh, I just uh, uh, gave one example of how to use this book Yes. Now, uh, so you can read just before you go to bed. Doesn't need to be exactly just before you go to bed at night. <laughs> and then after you get up in the morning and just uh, get whatever you get. Another way of actually doing this is, this book was written at least 22 centuries ago. People had a very different mentality. They lived in very different culture. Now, of course, a translation, a translator will bring his or her, you know, uh, culture into this, but it was long time ago. So some of the teachings are actually very primitive. And I don't agree with everything that Lao Tzu says. However, each chapter opens up a question. It is like a, entry into the inquiry. So Lao Tzu had, a, had inquired something and he, this was what he, he came up with. But original inquiry is eternal. What does it mean to be natural? What does it mean to be, uh, you know, uh, what does it mean to be authentic? What is real virtue? What does it mean to actually embody Tao? Those are the questions. And uh, so when you read this, use this 81 entry into a path of inquiry. And you can actually go beyond Lao Tzu. In some areas, he has gone very, very deep. Like 
chapter one. I mean, I can read this every day and uh, I will have a new, new discovery. But some chapters are, you know, over, overly simplistic. So that's one way of doing this. Um, Taoist meditations are very much you know, influenced by Buddhist meditation. And uh, so when you read the Buddhist meditation practices, you know, you can acquire, you can learn whatever it is and you can follow. <clears throat> Uh, thank you. Um, I just want to, I really like the fact that you said, okay, I disagree with Lao Tzu on several things, because I think that's, and, and he would actually agree with that, because he's saying, look, this is my words to describe the Tao. Yes. It's really between you and the Tao, <laughs> <laughs> for each of us. Yes, right? exactly. Yeah. And what anybody else says is only kind of indications, useful tips, and they should be regarded only as such. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and the other point that you make, which uh, is absolutely true, that we found uh, to, uh, you know, when, when we start looking at the translations, all translations are interpretations. Yes. And, but at the same time, they're valuable mm -hmm. of listening, just like reading multiple translations. Mm -hmm. you know, we are going through the Tao, Tao the Jing chapter by chapter. Everybody reading their own translation and then talking about it mm -hmm. actually it's like hearing multiple interpretations, but all those interpretations are other people's interpretations. Mm -hmm. And you kind of have to formulate your own integration. No question. About um, and so the, uh, one of the things I've been uh, recommending to uh, everybody, uh, Yasuhiko, is to write, you know, write as best as you can, because at least that is your capturing of that moment of what you understand. Mm -hmm. um, and then you know, keep, keep working at it. You know, it's, um, and I, I also find that it is really good. I, mean, I like the idea of keeping it by your bed, bedside um, because the way I find it useful is to kind of go over it again and again and again and again and again. And mm -hmm. each time, you know, you are keeping focused on you and the, and the Tao, you get some things. Yes. And you can see your own understanding evolve. Yes. So it is not, like the um, the technique, the Western technique of saying, okay, I'm going to take this text and understand it once and for all. It is much better dealt with almost in an aesthetic way. Yes. Letting all those, all the poetry, it's, there is just deep poetry in it. Yes. Uh, and it is kind of suggestive. Yes. As, as you were saying. So let that kind of flow over you. Exactly. And right. let you respond to it. Yes. As, you know, as authentically as possible. Yes. all the time over time. Yes. And after doing these layers and layers and layers of layers of work, hopefully you get a little bit more yes. <laughs> towards yes. the down. Yes, yes. Um, thank you. Uh, next up is going to be um, Eamon, Jean, and Heron. Eamon, go ahead. Uh, good afternoon, gentlemen. Thank you very much, first of all. Uh, in the spirit of authenticity, I actually wrote my question backwards. Um, I meant to ask uh, about your choice in translation. You translated the Tao Te Ching in the very classic sort of written form. Um, my question was how you came to make that choice of using the more Guadian version classic as opposed to the Ma Wang Dui version where it begins with chapter 38, goes through 81, and then begins with one through 37. So it'd be the the Dao Jing as opposed to Dao De Jing. And just your impressions on that discrepancy and those decisions people have made. You know, um, I have one uh, Chinese, uh, tr uh, Chinese uh, translation. Uh, from um, Pe uh, Beijing University, Chinese and uh, English translation by this uh, famous uh, Chinese scholar. <clears throat> and uh, he divided this into two, uh, Dao and Dei. And Dao ends at 37. And Dei starts, so two books, Dao, Book of Dao and Book of Dei, and they start from 38. And uh, I, but he still put them together and start from, you know, uh, from chapter one all the way to the 81. 
And uh, in my view, uh, praising the Tao that cannot be said in the chapter one, uh, really set the tone because it is, it contains everything. It's like, a, it matches the Chinese way of thinking. You look at the whole and then you, you, you kind of zoom into the part of it. And so if you understand uh, uh, chapter one, you basically understand everything of Tao uh, Te Ching. At the same time, in order to understand everything about Tao Te Ching, you need to read all of it at the same time. So it is like one and many. So 80 is in this eight, one chapter. And each chapter contains chapter one. So to me, it, it is more um, logical. <laughs> Ontologically and epistemologically more logical to have this, this, this order. And the 30, 38, chapter 38 uh, goes deeply into uh, death, virtue. And it's almost like a starting from uh, uh, midway. So um, you have to go back to chapter one anyways to be able to understand chapter 38 fully. So that's my, uh, my personal opinion. And that's how I will always translate this way. Wonderful. Um, next up is going to be Jean Heron and P. Chan. Jean. Yeah, uh, great lecture. So we have studied uh, the comparison of East and Western thinking process. And in many discussion, we think, you know, the Eastern is more feeler, feeling uh, emphasized than the Western is more thinker, thinker. And you mentioned about the knowledge from the, you know, the experience to theory, theoretical, then to intuitive. So I think Eastern is more intuitive. So I just wonder the learning process, do you have to go through that theoretical period to reach the intuitive? Or some people, they don't have to go through or you, they just don't explain the explicitly that process. I think that's maybe the reason in Eastern culture, people don't emphasize the explicit, explain the second period. That's why it's so hard to reach the third period. Most of people don't. There's a few people, maybe they have very, you know, good intuition, whatever, they reach automatically. The other people just got lost. That's why I mentioned last time, I said, it says in the Eastern culture, it seems you either get it 100% or zero. In the East, Western, you can get 250, you know, to, you know, you can get some part, maybe not all of them. At least you get some part. But I also noticed in the uh, education, it's just opposite right now. You know, I was a TA at architecture school and I found the teaching there, like the, it's kind of, they gave you a concept, do a tree house, then people just do whatever they do. And some people do a great job, they do, and some people do a terrible job. But then I was studying in China, it's just opposite. They teach you every step of doing a tree house and everybody come up maybe with the same thing because the teacher keep changing. If you want to do something unique, they change you back. So I found it's kind of interesting how the education is so different now. Maybe the Chinese, Apparently, they lost the Tao. So they're like, they, they don't really want to be unique. You, they want you to reach certain, but it works well for math because most people are not math genius. But at least you reach certain level. <laughs> American education is like, everything is bad with math because you don't want to do the basic. You just want to be a genius right away. So then you don't have the base. Just like swimming team, American swimming is so good because they're big pool of people like swimming <laughs> teams. Then you have a few genius, right? But here, math. People don't want to do it. They just want the other genius who don't know math. But in China, they have big pool of math, math team, you know? So then there are few genius come out. So I think this is kind of like, you from the base to the intuition, you know, the, to the higher level. You know, uh, as I was saying, um, our intelligence is holistic. And uh, so we have a, uh, intellection and uh, information processing, mental intelligence. We also have a, you can say heart intelligence, you, a feeling kind of intelligence. Now, of course our body has intelligence, you know, uh, kinetic intelligence as well as biological intelligence. So the, we are like a, a holistic intelligence. And ideal is that for the intelligence to work together. And what happened 
is that uh, we have emphasized on our mental intelligence so heavily. Now, unless you are a gifted uh, uh, athlete, and then you, you, you go into kinetic intelligence. But usually, we focus on the mental intelligence so heavily. And with the mental intelligence, there's a left brain and the right hemisphere and left hemisphere, more logical and more intuitive. And we seem to focus on the more left on the right. So um, original Taoists uh, talking about holistic intelligence. And probably we are much more uh, advanced in the mental intelligence in terms of logic. So if you, uh, if, uh, you and I take IQ test with uh, Lao Tzu and Chang Tzu, maybe we are smarter than <laughs> But who is more wise? Wiser. <laughs> so, you know, uh, holistic intelligence. It, so it is very important uh, from the very beginning of our, uh, you know, um, our education to pay attention to this holistic intelligence and in mental intelligence as well. It is not just a, um, uh, intuition is necessary for you to be fully rational. You know, people who are logical can be irrational. You have seen this. Some uh, brilliant engineer who is completely irrational in his life. And so rationality requires a sense of the whole. Ratio uh, amongst each other and ratio to the whole. So rationality requires an intuitive grasp of the whole. You see? So to become rational, you need to develop left and right uh, brain together. So it is not like a linearly, we do develop this, this, no. We should, we should develop all of it. Of course, uh, uh, children go through different uh, process of development. Sometimes they have to develop certain areas, but we have to always pay attention to the um, holistic intelligence. And holistic intelligence is qualitative. You can't compare one from the other. Somebody is not smarter in this sense. Somebody can be smarter in his own way than before. And uh, because of this becoming somebody uh, education and achieving a high status in society, we focus on particular aspects of our intelligence. And uh, as a result, we sacrifice holistic intelligence and actually human happiness. And also interesting thing is real masters Mathematical geniuses, they are very musical and artistic. It's, I think to be able to fully uh, become a mathematical genius, to be fully evolved as a mathematical genius, they need to have that artistic dimension because mathematics is actually, there's a most beautiful uh, expression of the ratio of the universe, yes. To be able to see that, you need to have that kind of intuitive uh, sense. So, Kurt Gödel, uh, through his uh, incomplete net theorem, indirectly proved <laughs> that intuition is essential for mathematics. <laughs> in my, in, that's my interpretation. Logic alone does not is always incomplete. Wonderful, thank you. Uh, and great question, Jean, really appreciate that. Uh, next up is going to be Heron followed by P. Chan. Heron. Thank you. Um, thanks for the, for the talk, Yashihiko. Um, my primary interest is in language and linguistics and the relationship between the voice in our head and uh, everything else. And I'd just be interested in hearing your thoughts on the voice in our head and how that influences everything else. And in addition to that, I just want to let you know that I sent you a relatively lengthy text message uh, in here. And uh, if you're interested in responding, I'd appreciate that you at least look at it and respond. Anyway, I'd like to hear your thoughts on the importance or non-importance of language. Thank you. So, <clears throat> Some philosophers said that uh, humans have had thought, but very few thinks. 
and voices in our head is like a automatic vibration that goes through in our brain mind system. And because those sounds, sounds are, have, have been devaluating since our uh, childhood, it has a form of thought. Probably somebody like Beethoven will listen only the sounds, at least some of the time. And you know, I listen to uh, music a lot, and sometimes I only hear the sounds. I don't hear any thought. So the thought are vibrations, and we are conditioned. We have been conditioned in such a way to continuously repeat those patterns of sounds, which has the form of thought. So we all have thought in our head. And it is nothing to do with thinking. And thinking is more like being. And thinking requires that our mind be quiet so that you originate thought, not uh, repeating the thought. So it is important for us to uh, be able to think really or authentically and also to achieve a sense of um, wholeness and stillness and to be able to embody Tao, it is important to actually make those voice become quiet. And meditation uh, is designed basically for that purpose. And one of the ways to you know, really uh, let this voice uh, go is to pay attention to, so we are, I was talking about paying attention to the pose of uh, breathing. So you breathing in and out and there's a pose. Same is true with thought. It is a vibration. There's always moment of silence. So when you meditate, you watch your thought going through your head. And then you begin to notice that there is a small pause between thought or sounds. And the more you become able to pay attention to this uh, in between, uh, stillness, silence, the stillness and silence start to expand. And uh, as a result, you recognize that, you know, oh, wow, my mind is much more quiet than before as a result of this, because your consciousness is now tuned to silence as well as sound. So that's another way of using uh, meditation to uh, free the voice. Now, there are voices in our head that actually has, um, I can't say this. In the beginning was the world and scientists and mathematicians and uh, creative people, sometimes they ask questions and trying to solve the, some problems. And one day when they wake up or whatever, thought comes to their head which is the answer that they have been looking for. And those are the sounds you want to listen to. <laughs> and they also come from the space of non-thought. So those are the voices. In the beginning was the world kind of voices that are created, the original thought. And that is important. And so being quiet and having an original thought and the creative thought goes together. Wonderful. Uh, next up is going to be Pichan followed by, we have got last two questions, Pichan and then Rupali. And then we'll wrap up uh, Pichan. Yeah, I, I wanted to underscore a comment that is it Sirkran made about having your own interpretation out of many. Uh, and, and then ask you to perhaps address it further, because it seems to imply that the, the Tao makes room for mistakes, that is more generous, that entering your own thought is the creative urge that allows you to enter into the Tao. And so therefore, that emptiness that it makes for you 
is not necessarily the correct one, but a gateway to ca the calling to enter into that thing. This so could you address that? I mean, it's like, I, I want to that. underscore that point. It I, seems I, so I, important. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, so taking on what you said in the previous uh, question, uh, so uh, many of you have read many different English translations. Uh, I actually haven't really read any uh, except for a few. And, but I have read the original Chinese many, you know, many, many times. And uh, so there are two things. When you read many different interpretations and the, from which you kind of uh, come up with your own inter, uh, integration. And another way of reading this is really reading from the emptiness and let the Lao Tzu speak to you. And uh, my way of reading has been the second letter. And when I was translating, uh, that's how I did the translation also. Uh, so it is least amount of interpretation possible and let Lao Tzu speak to me into my emptiness and based on whatever knowledge I have, interpret that into English. So it is recreation in English of what I have received from Lao Tzu and uh, being, having uh, no voice in your head helps us to understand uh, books like this uh, better. And the uh, interesting thing is some of the, I have read some uh, scholars, Chinese and Japanese scholars writing about this. Um, they know too much. And sometimes they think too much in interpreting uh, Lao Tzu and uh, they, may, they seem to be missing the point. And uh, so, um, reading too many <laughs> interpretation may, may be detrimental <laughs> in understanding what Lao Tzu has to say. Uh, wonderful. Next question is, last question is from Rupali. And I'm also putting the uh, website for Yasuhiko uh, in the chat. Uh, so please go ahead and visit the website. Uh, there is a lot of interesting essays there. He also conducts multiple courses, so please go and have a look. Um, next up is Rupali. Rupali, go ahead. Thank you, Shrikant. Um, this is <clears throat> a very um, thought-provoking uh, conversation. I wanted to ask, you know, when uh, uh, it's... So I come from India, and I've seen this with uh, the elders in my family that when they have internalized either Jainism or Buddhism or Hinduism, that there is a level of being quiet and silent and whether that makes us complacent. And I've always wondered that whether by internalizing uh, Taoism or any of the Eastern philosophies, whether they make us complacent and allow us to accept more things and not be as dynamic uh, as sometimes people in the West are? Yes. You know, uh, this is a very good question. Um, the default mode of human mind is believing. So we listen to somebody, we read some books, and uh, we believe or not believe what we hear. And then of course you believe in the thought you have. This is a, like a fundamental operating system that humans have acquired in the last uh, you know, millennia. We believe and uh, people become complacent to the authority that impart the belief that you have. So you can uh, read Lao Tzu, and Lao Tzu being this wise man from China, and he is imparting truth, and you begin to understand that you believe it. When that happens, there's a danger of becoming complacent. That's why I uh, always uh, 
emphasize the importance of Zen approach. Zen and, and the India Krishnamurti, uh, their teaching is not based on belief. Their teaching is based on inquiry and asking questions. And since Tao is infinite, <laughs> you can never really believe it. <laughs> and so Taoism is kind of conducive to that kind of approach because there are, well, because um, no matter how much you understand, there's more. So we can read uh, Dao De Ching as 81 gate of inquiry. And so Lao Tzu had an inquiry, what is Tao, what is they, and what is reality, what is, the, what is virtue? And he gave us the answer. But you want to read each chapter from the point of view question that he asked. And then you want to rethink what he says and uh, inquire into the, the question that he inquired into. And uh, as I said, uh, many chapters I, I don't agree with Lao Tzu and some are way too simplistic. At the same time, chapter one is an eternal source of inquiry. He has gone to the level, at least I have gone to the level of you know, Spinoza by reading this. <laughs> So we can, uh, we can continue to inquire. And I think it is very, very important to really be free from our belief systems and continue to inquire. Uh, wonderful, the, the, the concept of the beginner's mind. Yes. Uh, that's, that's huge, I mean, and you yeah. see it in all the sages, you know, all, yeah. all the true people, yeah. Yeah, yes. Um, uh, there is a last question from Franklin. You know, he's been at it for so long that I want to make an exception and sure. running out of time. But, uh, you know, I, can we take one more question? Absolutely. Okay. All right. Go ahead, Frank. I want to thank you. This was delightful. Do you have a favorite chapter? The chapter I like, um, well, chapter one. Chapter one. And uh, I have used chapter 17 because it has um, profound wisdom in what it means to be a leader. And uh, it had, I can speak about chapter 17 for two days and I have a seminar on leadership based on chapter seven, 17, 52 days. <laughs> <laughs> so I like chapter 17 uh, very much. And uh, I like my translation, that chapter, because I love it so much. Uh, I have done so much thinking, and uh, so I do like my chapter 17 translation very much. Uh, Yasuhiko, could you read out your chapter 17? That would be a fitting climax for this. The supreme leader is one whose existence is very known. Next best is one who is loved and praised. Next is one who is feared. The last is one who is contempt. No trust will ever be accorded to a leader who lacks integrity. Therefore, with deep commitment, honor your word and trust the words of others. Then when the work is done and success achieved, the people will say, we did it ourselves. Beautiful, beautiful. There's another side to this. Mm -hmm. You see, true leader is very known. Average people have difficulty understanding the man of Tao. So the same person can be loved and uh, praised, but different group of people may fear him and different people, people may actually despise him. We have seen that with many uh, political leaders. Mm -hmm. So there's another side of it. And uh, this is maybe the closest the 
Chinese philosophy ever, ever, ever come to democracy. <laughs> yeah, wonderful, wonderful. Um, so uh, Yasuhiko, this is a fantastic beginning to our monthly conversations. Yes. So folks, uh, this, we are going to be uh, you know, having conversations with Yasuhiko. Uh, this is just, as I said, you know, sheer delight and just profound uh, honor. Uh, it's going to be last Sundays of every month. The next one on June 27th is going to be the path of self-realization. July 25th, we are doing inner and outer transformation. On August 29th, we're talking about uh, wisdom in the high-tech age. So don't miss any of them and watch Yasuhiko's videos. Um, and I'm going to put the website again in the chat. And I have uh, two online courses coming and one of which is actually Dao De Ching. Wonderful. And at, at in uh, genkuwall.com, if you go to courses, you will find those courses, okay? So Yasuhiko, my friend, this is just incredible. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. Bye everybody. <laughs>